So yesterday we obviously got some of the worst data that we've had in months and as a result of that markets by and large crashed across the board. What was that data? Well it was the CPI inflation data that came out of the US over the last month and in short it was really pretty bad. We've now just received another brand new 41 year inflation high of 8.6% which comes days or weeks after every single pundit on Bloomberg and CNBC and coming out of Biden's administration itself told us that inflation had peaks that we are on the way back down and that there's nothing to be worried about. Now, as a result of this scare, as a result of the fact that inflation isn't over and it is still a major problem that is wrecking havoc, not only on the markets, but on the economy as a whole, Biden made a little bit of an appearance. He came out and spoke for what actually is quite a long time for him, far longer than we usually get. And he spoke specifically about inflation, about how he plans to fix it, about what he's done in the past. And I think it's a little bit prudent to actually listen to what he has to say. Now, usually he isn't on brilliant form. I know that more than most, but actually he was on pretty decent form yesterday. He wasn't ideal, but he was relatively coherent and he actually made some valid points. So with that, I'm going to show you basically what he specifically had to say. And then I'm going to have to do the unfortunate thing of explaining why some of the things that he did say are categorically wrong. And this really just amounts to a little bit more of Democrat propaganda to try and ensure that no one believes that it's his administration's fault for the situation that the American economy is in. Look, folks, um, today I'd like to speak about my top economic priority, fighting inflation. I understand Americans are anxious, and they're anxious for good reason. I was raised in a household when the price of gasoline rose precipitously. It was the discussion at the table. It made a difference when food prices went up. But we've never seen anything like Putin's tax on both food and gas. America should also understand our economy has unique strengths that we can build on. The job market is the strongest it's been since World War II, notwithstanding the inflation. We added another 390,000 jobs last month, 8,700,000 new jobs since I took office. An all-time record, never that many jobs in that period of time. Unemployment rate is near historic lows. Millions of Americans are moving up to better jobs and better pay. And since I took office, families are carrying less debt on average in America. They have more savings than they've had. And we're doing it all while cutting the federal deficit by $1.7 trillion this year and $320 billion last. If I hear one of my MAGA friends once again talk about debt and deficits, I'm, go I'm going to be good. Uh, they increased the deficit by $2 trillion. Anyway, that's another story. But look, this is the largest decline in American history. Because of the progress, America can tackle inflation from a position of strength unlike any other country in the world, because every country in the world is getting a big bite and piece of this inflation, worse than we are in the vast majority of countries around the world. But make no mistake about it. I understand inflation is a real challenge to American families. Today's inflation report confirmed what Americans already know. Putin's price hike is hitting America hard. Gas prices at the pump. Energy and food prices account for half of the monthly price increases since May. Inflation outside of energy and food, what they, the economists call core inflation, moderated the last two months. Not enough, but it moderated. It's come down. And we need it to come down much more quickly. My administration is going to continue to do everything we can to lower the prices to the American people, and the Congress has to act, and they have been of late. One of the key ways to fight inflation is by lowering the cost of moving goods through the supply chain. When I first started talking about the supply chain, when I came here well over a year ago, the American people understandably wondered, supply chain, well, I mean, that's not a usual part of their jargon every day. But they understand it fully now. They understand it. If you can't get the material needed to build a product you're building, whether it's an automobile or whatever it is, it makes it difficult to be able to move. And that's called the supply chain. That's why I've been focused on ports. Last fall, ports around the world were congested due to disruptions caused by the pandemic. So we brought together port operators, shipping companies, and labor, and to ease the bottlenecks. And as a result, over the holidays last, 97% of all the packages 
were delivered on time and on shelves when you went Christmas shopping. Remember, we weren't going to have anything on those shelves. You all did it. No, no, not a joke. You did it. On time with minimal delay. Delivery times are actually quicker than they were before the pandemic. And today, there are about 40 percent fewer containers clogging the docks on long, for long periods of time than there were last November. This May was the strongest month in the Port of Los Angeles' history, the strongest month in its history. And we're helping fund improvements because of what my friends in the Congress have done. We passed the, we passed the infrastructure bill, and we're, and we're funding major new initiatives on the docks, on dock rail systems. Port of Long Beach has moved goods more quickly. A port electrification, so communications near the ports can be — and communities can breathe cleaner air because you're using electric machines that are not generating — using gas, coal, et cetera. And we're continuing to expand capacity of our ports thanks to the bipartisan infrastructure law. Look, this is a time we took a different approach also to trucking. Remember, last December, we brought together industry and labor to tackle problems facing truck drivers. It took the double — we had to double the number of commercial driver licenses being issued by the states in order to speed things up. We did it. We sped the creation and registration of apprenticeships, allowing aspiring drivers to earn while they were learning. The result? We had a record-setting employment in trucking earlier this year. And truckers' wages went up even after accounting for inflation. We're going to keep at it with the new super chain envoy, General Steve Lyons. General Lyons is a four-star general. He handled the transportation of a little bit of thing. He had Transportation Command, only tens of millions of billions of tons of things to move, from little things like tanks and aircraft and all that. But all kidding aside, he's come off the sidelines. He's retired. He's helped us identify and get ahead of the challenges that raise uh, — that, that arise at our ports, our railroads, and on the road. This is about reducing costs for families. You know, I have to admit to you, a lot of us elected officials have been in office for a while. Every once in a while, something you learn makes you viscerally angry. Like if you had the person in front of you, you'd want to pop them. No, I really mean it. There are nine, nine major ocean line shipping companies that ship from Asia to the United States. Nine. They form three consortium. These companies have raised their prices by as much as 1,000 percent. So everything coming from Asia, they, they, they get 90-some percent of it, the stuff coming from Asia. They've raised it by 1,000 percent. That's why I called on Congress to crack down on — and they're foreign-owned. Foreign-owned shipping companies that raise their prices while raking in just last year a hundred and $90 billion in profit, a seven-fold increase in one year, seven-fold increase, $190 billion. The Senate passed legislation. I'm hopeful the House is going to act soon to crack down on these companies, as I've asked, and lower the cost. And I'm grateful <laughs> to two Californians, Speaker Pelosi and John Gerundi, uh, for, uh, for leading this effort. Thanks, John. I really mean it. It's a big deal. People at home trying to make it you know, paycheck to paycheck, are wondering, like, what in God's name do nine — understand me, nine shipping companies have to do with it? Well, almost everything you're doing, everything from what, what you're eating to what you're having to drive to what you're what, — what you need in your home, it related to supply chains and what's coming from abroad. I'm doing everything in my power to blunt Putin's price hike and bring down the cost of gas and food. I led the world to coordinate the largest release of the global oil reserves in history, 240 million barrels to boost supply to keep prices from rising even more. Thanks to America's leadership in diplomacy, we've helped Europe reduce its reliance on Russian oil by tripling our natural gas systems to Europe compared to last year. And I'm working closely with our European partners to get 20 million tons of grain locked in Ukraine, already in their silos now. Ukraine and Russia, the two major suppliers of grain and corn, they have 20 million barrels — I mean, 20 million in, — in their, in, in their silos right now. So we're trying to help them to get that, and the Russians are blocking the export. 
They're not allowed out to the Black Sea, and we're trying to figure out how to get it out of the country to get to around the world. It will bring down prices. But there's more. There's more than one way to solve this problem. We're continuing to working to bring down food prices and gas prices and save families' mother money by dealing with other items. My dad used to say, it's all about the standard of living, how much you have left in the paycheck at the end of the month, how much is left to do the basic things. So if you add up all the things that people need just to do their, to do everything from take care of their kids to turn the heat on or the air conditioning on and everything in between, there's a lot of ways we can reduce their cost, their cost of living, other than if we, while we're trying to get at, at the grain and, uh, and gas. We laid out a plan, for example, lower prescription drug costs. That would fundamentally affect the well-being of every family. Those of you who know somebody who has type 2 diabetes and has, in, has an insulin requirement monthly, you know it costs an average of $647 a month. It can cost as high as 1000 of some places. You know how much it costs to make that one little vial of insulin? $10, T-E-N, $10. No new research has been done since that was invented. And the charging is outrageous. So I think we should be able to have the Medicare do what they do when they deal with the VA. VA says we're only going to pay you so much for this if you don't want to, and because they, the Medicare negotiates the price for them. Well, if Medicare is able to negotiate the price on insulin, guess what? It comes down a whole hell of a lot. Outrageous numbers. So we could put a cap on insulin at $35 a month, and they'll still make a significant profit. 10 bucks to manufacture, 35 bucks. So in the interest of fairness, what did Biden say there that was actually true? What is he being honest about? And what has he done that's good for the country in regards to inflation? Well, he mentioned a fair bit about actually the improvement to the supply side, the supply chain crisis that we've seen in the United States over the last year or so. If you remember about a year ago, there was a massive backlog of container ships in almost every port in America. And for the most part, that situation has seriously cleared up. Biden and his administration and the government as a whole's response to that crisis was actually relatively effective. They helped to ensure that these ports would work through their backlog to work overtime, they negotiated with unions and things like that, and they actually got that problem solved. And so credit where credit is due. Congratulations, Joe, that was a job well done. And actually, yes, your actions there did help to reduce inflation to some extent. Unfortunately, it just so happens that supply and demand in the other aspects of the economy are far too dominant. And so really, inflation is still mega high despite that minor success. Now, the other area where Biden was right on track and actually correct was in trucking and for the exact same sort of reasons, increasing the number of truck drivers across the country has helped to ensure that there isn't that shortage that people were fearing and that actually started to come about. Again, that will in the long term show to have actually improved the state of inflation. Unfortunately, though, this being the exact same situation as with the container ship crisis, well, it just isn't quite enough to counteract the rest of the forces going on. Now, unfortunately, that is pretty much where the good stuff ends here. The rest of what Biden said and what he spoke about regarding inflation is mostly nonsense, with the first big thing being the word that he mentions constantly over and over again, Putin and Putin's price hike. Now, the reason he uses this phrase is very clear. It's a catchy phrase. It's got a bit of alliteration. It's very difficult to get out of your head and everyone knows what it means instantly. So Biden and many, many other Democratic politicians are parroting this phrase over and over again to try and drill it into people in America's mind that actually these price hikes are the fault of Putin. Now, there is some credence to this claim. Yes, oil prices are more expensive because of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, but more specifically because of the Western reaction to that invasion because of the sanctions that we've placed on Russia. The same is to be said for natural gas prices in Europe in particular, but actually they've risen in the US as well. And again, that is mostly due to this war in Ukraine. The same is also definitely true for the grain crisis, for the lack of corn and wheat, as Russia and Ukraine are massive exporters. And most of this is attributable to Putin's invasion of the country. The problem is, though, that Biden and the rest of the Democratic Party are trying to convince everyone that prior to this invasion, there was no inflation problem, that the incredibly loose monetary and even fiscal policy of the United States has not been a contributing factor to inflation, when in reality, it's the vast majority of the inflation that we've been seeing. 
In particular, Biden makes specific note of gasoline prices because they are just so influential when considering the average American's daily life. And he loves to make the point that actually this is a Putin price hike, that it comes from Putin's actions, when in reality, gas prices have been rising for the entirety of the last year, long before this war ever kicked off. And that is mostly because of the irresponsible monetary and fiscal stimulus put into place by firstly Biden and his administration, and then by the Federal Reserve and Jerome, Jerome Powell, who was appointed by Biden and his administration. So it is not physically possible. You cannot claim in good faith that the Democratic Party is not at least partially, and in my opinion, majorly responsible for this inflation situation. And so I really do feel it's quite important to take note that every time someone says Putin's price hike or Putin's price raises, that people call him out on that, that we make sure that this doesn't become another instance of the Ministry of Truth, where politicians lie to our faces and convince us to deny the evidence in front of our eyes. Now, the next major problem with what Biden spoke about there was regarding corporate greed and this incredibly childish and infantile idea that actually inflation is the fault of corporate greed and not the government and its actions in the first place. Now, we've seen this time and time again, in particular from Democratic politicians like Senator Warren, who absolutely love to parrot this childish idea. And Biden just went on a similar little tirade there talking about the shipping crisis. He made note that actually shipping companies are making lots of money right now. And he's claiming that actually they are the sole reason for the inflation in that industry, that they are immune to supply and demand shifts and that actually they are basically price setters. And so they've just decided to raise prices and make more profit and they're being greedy in doing so. Now, to anyone who has even a basic understanding of economics, this is obviously ludicrous. The problem is, though, actually a lot of people don't have that basic understanding and they believe Biden when he says this. They take his words at face value when really they shouldn't. The simplest way to explain why this is such a silly idea is to ask, were these companies being generous when they kept prices low then? No, of course they weren't. They weren't able to rise prices back then because the economic environment in which they operated wouldn't allow them to because they are not price setters. They are functions of supply and demand. They do not get to decide how expensive shipping is. We then saw a similar thing come out of Biden there regarding medical companies and medical supplies, and in particular, insulin prices. Biden makes note of how medical prices in the US are astronomically high, which is true. Let's not get it twisted. They are ridiculously high. Mostly they're paid for by the government and insurance. But when people don't have government assistance or insurance, well, that does cause real problems. And it's a very hot topic issue. The problem is, once again, Biden claims that this is a problem of corporate greed, that it's companies deciding to set prices this high and customers being forced to accept those prices without any kind of recourse. The problem is the reason customers have to accept those prices is because of inefficient government regulation that limits the amount of suppliers of these products in the first place. In a free market, there would be another 100 companies producing insulin selling for prices less than we see currently in the US, and that would force prices down, and this wouldn't be a problem, but the government had to get their dirty little grubby hands involved and cause this lack of supply, which is the reason prices are so damn high. It is odd then to hear Biden rally against this when in reality, it's a very easy problem to fix and not necessarily by using Medicare or Medicaid to mandate that prices are low, but just by relaxing regulations or allowing more companies to enter that market, reducing the barriers to entry, letting entrepreneurial spirit and capitalism take hold and actually drive prices down because that is what capitalism ultimately does. Now, as I said, Biden was actually on pretty good form there, and it's actually quite interesting to hear something coming out of his mouth for once. We don't get to hear from him an awful lot. We very rarely get questions or anything like that, but this was quite a prolonged speech. Maybe he's feeling a little bit better recently, but either way, I actually do appreciate him coming out and doing this. I think he should do it far more, and hopefully we get more videos like this in the future. If you enjoyed this video, then make sure to like, comment, and subscribe to bless the YouTube algorithm. It really does help. If you want to join our exclusive community, then check out our Patreon. You get access to our Discord server and extra content like access to my portfolio and buy and sell alerts for all my own investments. Also, make sure to check out the link in the description to Masterworks. It can help you protect your portfolio against market turmoil through fractional shares of art from world-famous artists. Art has historically proven to be uncorrelated to the markets, so it's a really valuable resource with the markets falling every week.
There's also a link in the description to iTrust Capital, which helps you to invest in crypto through your tax advantaged IRA, which could literally save you thousands. If you, like me, think crypto going down is a buying opportunity, then now is the perfect time to join iTrust Capital. Thank you all for watching. Stay stoic. Until next time.